Hey guys, welcome to another video. This one is Polkadot Explained. I'm gonna go through all of the technology behind Polkadot, and then as an investor, should you consider Polkadot as an investment? We can actually see that Polkadot is number four in terms of market cap in the cryptocurrency space right now. So it's a big market cap already, and the technology is pretty promising, so we'll look at everything right here. This video is split up into sections and I will leave all of the timestamps for this video in the description below, right beside the subscribe button. If you wanna see more videos like this, then do go ahead and subscribe. But looking at the market cap of Polkadot right now, now XRP recently has had a lot of bad news, so that's come off, but we can see Polkadot is actually number four by market cap. So almost a 17 billion market cap right now, which is conveniently around 10 times less than Ethereum, which a lot of people do actually compare the two, although we'll go through a comparison later on. There are some similarities, but there are a lot of differences between these two as well. Coming through to a history of Polkadot though and a recap of the history so far, it was actually founded in 2016 by Ethereum co-founder Gavin Wood, which is why so many people often compare the two. And if we look at Ethereum, you can see this is really the biggest uh, blockchain that supports decentralized finance and also smart contracts, which is something that Polkadot can support as well. And Solidity is the code that Ethereum uses to execute these smart contracts. Gavin Wood actually created this. So he's taken all this knowledge and really left to build a new chain without the problems of Ethereum. That was what he said anyway. For him, Ethereum was a first gen product and so founders often do leave and go and start new things and obviously uh, take what they learned before and then implement that with some new technologies as well. Gavin actually says that Ethereum and Polkadot aren't really competitors, but they can coexist. And that's, I think, important to know because there won't just be one winner in the cryptocurrency space. There's gonna be a lot of different winners. And anyway, there's a lot of different implementations and reason, reasons why you'd use a blockchain. So we'll go into that. Now, DOT has raised about $200 million with two coin sales so far, making it one of the best funded blockchains in history for what it wants to do. Polkadot went live in May 2020, but it wasn't until August 2020 until token transfers went live for the first time. That's important because we are still very early in the life cycle for Polkadot, even though it's had a big run up and you can see that it is doing very well and it's got a large market cap, but we're still in very early days. One of the things that makes Polkadot stand out is how it was built on a proof of stake framework. And this is different to older blockchains that were built on a proof of work framework. Proof of stake blockchains should theoretically have lower cost and be easier to scale up, which is one of the issues that Ethereum is facing right now. Polkadot is a little bit different though because it's actually a blockchain that wants to be an ecosystem of other blockchains, meaning that it can benefit from more traffic and also more coins built upon the Polkadot framework. Polkadot is actually a really complex project and a little like Ethereum is built on a system which you can build other apps or other blockchains on top of. So with Ethereum, it's really about building apps on top and with Polkadot, it's about building other blockchains on top of it. So let's look at how Polkadot actually works in terms of its blockchain and then the ability to have other blockchains that come off of the main blockchain. So uh, Polkadot actually operates two types of blockchain. The first is called Relay Chain, and that is the actual Polkadot blockchain. That is where transactions are processed and permanent, and it can process over a thousand transactions per second as of making this video. And then you have user-created networks called parachains. These use resources of the main chain, the main relay chain, but parachains can be customized for any number of uses and feed into the main blockchain so that transactions and security is better. As Polkadot is a proof of stake blockchain, people can then put up their Polkadot coins as collateral to participate in the blockchain. And if they do a good job, that means they keep the network up and running and they do get rewarded in Polkadot for doing that. But if they don't keep the network in good order, their dot will be slashed, which essentially means being taken away from them. So that's really how proof of stake works. You put up your coins as collateral. If you do a good job, then you get rewarded. And if you don't, so you don't keep the network running well, then you can have your coins taken away. In addition to the relay chain and parachains, you also have bridges. These will actually allow DOT to interact with other blockchains like Ethereum, EOS, Cosmos, and even Bitcoin. 
and would allow tokens to be swapped without a central exchange. That means easy and cheap token exchange swaps, which is quite a big deal. Like I said, Polkadot relies on something called a proof of stake blockchain, but it actually goes one further and uses something called nominated proof of stake. With this framework, Polkadot uses something called validators. Now these are people that stake their dot coins and validate transactions on the blockchain. They put up their coins and participate in keeping the blockchain actually up and running. They validate proof from other people called collators and make sure that transactions are being created properly. You then have nominators, and these are the people that secure the relay chain. So that's the center pillar of DOT. So they help select good validators. It's like an extra layer of security. Usually if you want to earn re rewards in proof of stake blockchains, you need to actually have a lot of that crypto and then also have a computer running the blockchain 24 seven. So you need to actually be part of it. But that is what validators do in Polkadot. But if you don't actually wanna help run the blockchain and you don't wanna be part of that and you don't want the risk of actually losing your Polkadot if you stake them, if you maybe go down, so your computer goes down and doesn't run the blockchain, then you can be a nominator. So this way you can actually stake some of your DOT, help choose the validators. And then in this way, you can help the network to stay in good order and still earn some polka dot, but obviously take way less risk. You then have collators and these guys communicate between the relay chain and the parachains and they will send all of their transactions from the parachains to the validators in order for them to create a whole new block of transactions in the relay chain. Then you have something called fishermen, which I like to think of as like a bounty hunter. So they will monitor the validators and collators and they can stake their dot and then go around and basically find any bad behavior on the network. If they do find bad behavior, they'll be rewarded with quite a lot of polka dot. But if they make a bad call, then their dot will be sharded or taken away from them. So it's just another level of security, trying to keep everything running well on the system. One of the things that Polkadot wants to do is actually create a system where all blockchains are interoperable. So you can switch from one to the other and coins on one will be able to be used on another. And what we can see here is that Polkadot is trying to actually produce something called a wrapped Bitcoin. So this will be essentially a Bitcoin that you can use as an asset. So if you have Bitcoin, you can use that as collateral and an asset. And then you can actually use that to issue coins on Polkadot. So the first one is actually going to be a Polkadot coin coin that is backed by BTC. Right now you have blockchains that are different and have different code and so it's actually quite complex. You need wallets that support each type of token but doing this should make it easier to actually use Bitcoin and then go ahead and issue other contracts and take part in other DeFi projects. This should launch in March 2021 so it's something to look out for. Polkadot has also come into some staking issues though. So as the technology in the blockchain has grown, there have been some issues. So this was a recent problem with staking dot coins and they've actually changed the calculation used to stabilize the network at the moment. So what the problem was is that if you tried to stake fewer than 200 Polkadot coins, you may not have actually been receiving any staking rewards, which is obviously an issue, but developers are working on a fix for this. If you're just an investor and you have some Polkadot that you wanna to stake to earn a return on, you can still do that if you use decentralized exchanges. I think Kraken supports it at least um, on the website. I think it says Kraken supports this and a couple of other ones you can see here. So that's good for investors. If you are a larger participant, then it's obviously an issue, but if you're just an investor, then uh, Polkadot staking is still available for us. Polkadot Treasury is also something that they're working on. And this is essentially a pot of funds that is built up from transaction fees on the network and from some other things like slashing, so taking the polka dot away from bad actors on the network and also just staking inefficiencies. So there's an amount of polka dot coins in the treasury and then members of the council can vote on how to spend these funds. They can be spent on either marketing for the network or network upgrades or collaborations and a lot more. But the funds have a certain period where they need to be spent. So if they aren't spent, they'll actually just be burned. That's quite good because it means that any coins that are out of the system do get burned, uh, meaning the supply is smaller, which is usually good for the price. But it's also good that the council can vote on how to use these. So that treasury is working. Polkadot have also launched something called the Thousand Validators Program. Remember I talked about proof of stake and how Polkadot uses validators. Well, they want a thousand of them running on the network. So this is another step towards 
confirming really a true decentralized secure blockchain. Polkadot on its test network, Kusama, will aim for a thousand validators and they're doing the same thing on their main network, obviously the Polkadot network. The more validators you have, of course, the more secure the blockchain is in theory. And validators went, I think, from 25 to near 900 now. So they obviously have enough demand for this. More validators means more decentralization. And of course, if you are a validator, you can get rewarded with Polkadot, which is why people would do it. What are the main differences then and similarities between Polkadot and Ethereum? And to be honest, they're actually really, really different, although on the surface they look very similar, but they do have some similarities. Ethereum, when it moves over to Ethereum 2.0, will be more like Polkadot because they're switching over to a proof of stake blockchain. So that is gonna be similar to what Polkadot does. But really Polkadot tries to address some of the problems with Ethereum, which was really, Ethereum had a massive problem scaling up to become a larger network. Proof of work is fine for Bitcoin, but not for a network that is supposed to be large and have a lot of users. Proof of work just takes up way too much computing power unnecessarily. So Ethereum is moving over to proof of stake, but Polkadot was built on proof of stake from the ground up. Ethereum also has a lot of problems with extremely high gas fees. That means really that the more people that wanna use Ethereum, the higher the fees are, which is a really, really big problem for Ethereum. Ethereum are trying to sort this out uh, and it looks like they're gonna be successful with that, which is great. And again, Polkadot was really built with that in mind, scalability in mind, and so the fee structure is kind of different. They are really different in their outlook though. Ethereum is trying to build a platform that people can use to build applications on top of. So you have Ethereum, you have the code, you know what that code is, and then you build an application on top. Basically like having an Android ecosystem. So Ethereum can be compared to Android. It's like an operating system or an ecosystem, a blockchain that people can use and then put apps on top of and use and other applications. Polkadot is really different though in that it attempts to be a blockchain that is an ecosystem for other blockchains. So you can actually use some of the code that goes along with Polkadot and build your own blockchain, but then uses Polkadot's uh, blockchain to process all of the transactions. The way that they're governed is also really, really different. So Polkadot actually uses a council and there are votes and it's kind of more democratic. So if you have coins, if you're, if you're a participant in the network, you can actually go and vote on how the network moves forward. To recap though, Polkadot really is a framework that allows for other blockchains to be built on top of it at a low cost and then sits in the middle to allow those blockchains to process transactions. It allows for cross blockchain transfer of data and assets, not just tokens. It also allows Polkadot to be upgraded without hard forks like we've seen in many other cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash, Ethereum and Ethereum Classic. That is Polkadot Explained though. If you got to this point and haven't subscribed as yet, please do hit the subscribe button for way more crypto content. Hit the like button as well. Let me know what you thought of this video in the comments and I'll see you in the next one.